All right, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Rachel Martinez. My pronouns are they, them, and I am a member of the AZLA Professional Development Committee. I will be your moder moderator for today's webinar. The AZLA Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details on the slide that's shown now. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. There will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please submit questions via the chat at the bottom of your screen. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Carrie Dawson will be our technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her directly via the chat. If you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number provided in your registration confirmation email. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you complete a simple four question evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use the data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. Before we, we, we continue to the presentation, I will read the land acknowledgement statement and a few promotional slides. The land statement, the Arizona Library Association wishes to acknowledge the native nations that have inhabited Arizona lands for centuries. We honor the people of these nations on whose ancestral homelands and resources AZLA member libraries were built. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold Arizona Library Association members accountable to the information needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. Uh, a word on membership. I'd like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona. Visit www.azla.org for additional information. Please support AZLA when you add our organization as your designated charity and purchase through the Amazon Smile portal, Amazon will donate 5% of your eligible purchases made to the Arizona Library Association. Emporia State University is in Emporia, Kansas and its School of Library and Information Management, also known as SLIM, is the oldest library school west of the Mississippi River, having started in 1902. SLIM offers a Master of Library Science degree and is ALA accredited and requires 36 hours with a fully online option. SLIM's class size is small with 25 or fewer students in a section. SLIM has outstanding and award-winning faculty with a prolific research profile and excellence in teaching. Each student has a dedicated and caring academic advisor from admission to graduation. SLIM's tuition rate is very affordable at $19,000 for the whole degree. Thanks to generous donors, SLIM is offering more than $120,000 of scholarships each year. SLIM has a variety of concentrations from archives to health information. If you want to be a librarian, come to SLIM. I would also like to invite you to the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by the AZLA Professional Development Committee. On March 10th, join us for Using Open Plus Technology and Collaboration to Service Library Patrons with Mandy Carrico, Sky Larson, and Becky Gallivan Butler. In March 2021, the Scottsdale Public Library launched Pony Express at Appaloosa using Bibliotheca's Open Plus software. This abbreviated library self service allows registered patrons access inside the Appaloosa Library branch without library staff present. This project was a collaboration of many departments, including library staff, technology, marketing graphics, municipal security, and facilities. As a result of the pandemic, we temporarily shifted to a self-service model, and we'd like to share how we successfully opened the library building with limited hours to patrons. Registration for this webinar is posted on the Arizona State Library's events calendar, the AZLA calendar, advertised in the monthly professional development email blast, and a link will be provided in your webinar follow-up email. With that being said, I would like to thank you all for attending today. 
I will now pass presenter privileges to Christine Peterson, Mary Viegas, Megan Hammond, and Melanie Toledo for their presentation eBooks from the Arizona State Library. Christine, I think you're muted. I apologize for that. Okay, too many things going on here. So let me just say that we are delighted that you have taken the time to find out more about the ebook services provided through the Arizona State Library. In a minute, I'll introduce my colleagues, but first let me say that we appreciate the funding for these projects, which came from the Arizona State Library Archives and Public Records, a division of the Arizona Sec Secretary of State with federal funds from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So today we're gonna to be discussing two projects, Reading Arizona, which is an ebook and audiobook collection available to every resident of the state, Megan Hammond, will take you through the makeup of this collection and show you how you can start reading today. The second is a pilot project specifically focused on providing ebooks and audiobooks to tribal libraries. Maria Viegas will discuss the inception of this project and provide details on the project itself. Then I will step back in to discuss the app that's used in this project and then Melanie Toledo, whose library is a participant in the project, will finish by giving you her thoughts and how it has been received by her community. As I mentioned, you'll hear from Megan first, who is our Reading Arizona expert, then Mary Viegas, who will provide an introduction to the pilot project. I'll step in to discuss the app used in the project, and Melanie will conclude with her thoughts as a participant of the program. As Rachel said, if you have questions anytime during the session, please use the chat functionality and we will answer them after the formal presentation. And with that, I'm going to turn the session over to Megan. Thanks, Christine. As she said, my name is Megan Hammond. I'm the administrator of the Research Library Branch at the Arizona State Library Archive Public Records. I've been with the State Library for almost six years, and before that I worked at the Prescott Valley Public Library and the Yavapai County Free Library District. I'm so excited to talk to you today about our Reading Arizona ebook platform, which is just one of the many online resources provided by the State Library. Uh, the Research Library collects resources all about the history, culture, and government of Arizona. However, many patrons are not able to come into our reading room in downtown Phoenix to access our materials. That's why we prioritize making as many of our resources available online as possible. Next slide, please. This part of the presentation is going to answer these three questions. What is Reading Arizona? How does it work? And how can libraries share it with patrons? Next slide. Reading Arizona is a curated exploration of all things Arizona. It contains a mix of topics and ranges from children's books to university press publications. Every title is either about Arizona or set in Arizona, and it's a great way to introduce people to their state from the comfort of their home. Next slide, please. This chart is a breakdown of the subject matter of the collections. Um, I'm not sure how well you're able to see it, but the big red bar, that's our fiction collection. Um, in addition to that, we have nonfiction titles on Arizona history, nature, travel, social science, cooking, biographies and autobiographies, political science, sports, and true crime. It's uh, full of diverse voices and content, both by and about underrepresented populations, and special attention has been paid to indigenous topics, women in the borderlands. Basically, Arizona history is not all about white Earp. Next slide, please. 
I'm going to take you through the top five titles in the collection, the ones that get checked out the most. Um, here we have an Indigenous People's History of the United States for young people. We also have the adult people version. But this one was the 2020 American Indian Youth Literature Young Adults Honor Book. And according to the publisher, it goes beyond the story of America as a country discovered by a few brave men in the new world. Indigenous human rights advocate Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz reveals the roles that settler colonialism and policies of American Indian genocide played in forming our national identity. The original academic text is fully adapted for middle grade and young adult readers to include discussion topics, archival images, original maps, recommendations for further reading, and other materials to encourage students, teachers, and general readers to think critically about their own place in history. Next slide, please. The number four is a tie. First, we have Reclaiming Diné History. According to the publisher, this groundbreaking book, the first Navajo to earn a doctorate in history seeks to rewrite Navajo history. Reared on the Navajo Nation in New Mexico and Arizona, Jennifer Nez Dennettdale is the great, great, great granddaughter of a well-known Navajo chief, Manuelito, and his nearly unknown wife, Juanita. Stimulated in part by seeing photographs of these ancestors, she began to explore her family history as a way of examining broader issues in Navajo historiography. And the second title here is Thomas Sheridan's Arizona a History, and this edition was published for the centennial which shared and revised to incorporate events and changes that have taken place in more recent years. It addresses contemporary issues like land use, water rights, dramatic population increases, suburban sprawl, and the US-Mexico border. Next slide, please. This book, The Arizona Place Names, was written by Will Croft Barnes shortly before his death in 1937. From 1905 to 1935, he traveled throughout the state, largely on horseback, which enabled him to gather the anecdotes and geographical information that came to constitute the Arizona place names. I can tell you that this book is used frequently by my staff to answer patron questions about the history of place names in Arizona. Next slide, please. Our second most popular title is Understanding the Arizona Constitution. According to the publisher, this book is the definitive guide to Arizona government and serves as a solid introductory text for classes on the Arizona Constitution. Extensive endnotes make it a useful reference for professionals within the government, and it serves as a tool for any engaged citizen looking for information about online government resources, administrative rules, and voter rights. And finally, next slide. This should be a familiar name to all Arizona librarians, but our most popular title is by J.A. Dance, and it's the most recent addition to the Joanna Brady series set in Cochise County. Next slide. So who's reading? Everyone, it's the general public, writers, historians, state employees, educators, and subject specialists. Anyone who lives in Arizona don't even need to have a library card to set up a Reading Arizona account. Although I promise we always encourage patrons to get library cards and take advantage of all of the wonderful resources offered by the public libraries across the state. Our goal is to supplement what you offer and not to replace you or your other ebook platforms. Next slide. So how does it work? It's pretty simple. You just go to readingarizona.org, create a free account, and download the Baker and Taylor's Access 360 app. If you want to, you can follow along at home. I'm gonna go through it right now. Next slide, please. So this is the Reading Arizona homepage from readingarizona.org direct here. Um, you can scroll down for instructions about how to create the account, as well as some other information about uh, the collections in general, the most recently added titles. And if you click the logo, you're directed to the platform itself. Next slide. So this is Baker and Taylor's platform um, to create an account. Users just need to click on the login button in the upper right hand corner of the screen. And next slide, that pops up this uh, login screen. And if you don't have a username down there at the bottom, you can click there. And next slide. And this is where the system tries to authenticate the patrons. 
So originally Reading Arizona was geolocated. Geo Anybody just within Arizona could access it, but we, after a platform migration, um, that capability was lost. So instead patrons are asked to just name, what's the full name of your state? And so they just have to enter Arizona with a capital A and from there they can create a username and password. And then next slide, you can either read in the browser or download the Access 360 app, which is available on all of the phones, smartphones anyway. <laughs> um, next slide. So here um, is how the platform looks in a browser. And once you're signed in, it's pretty easy to navigate. Um, patrons can use the search bar, do advanced searches of the collection, limit the results by availability and format. Next slide. And um, there's also some curated lists and featured lists. So we have staff recommendations, which um, include just you know the favorite books from our staff, as well as um, books about Arizona women or um, travel books. And then there's the always available book. Next slide. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the subscription licensing. Um, whenever possible, we purchase single or multi-user titles for perpetual ownership. So um, that makes up about 80% of our collection. And for that reason, we expect it to continue to grow over time. Uh, the remaining titles are purchased with whatever licensing model the publishers require. Um, or we will buy additional temporary copies if there's a popular title currently in demand. Next slide, please. So this is an example of one of our always available titles, uh, The Trunk Murderous by Jana Bomberstock. If you look down where the circle is, you can see that we have 9,999 copies. Um, that is the way the system tells us that it's um, available for simultaneous use. These titles are ideal for book clubs and assigned student reading, especially when everyone needs to be reading the same volume or edition of the book. All right, next, title, next page. So how can you share Reading Arizona with your patrons? Um, there's just a few ways. You can add a link to your website. You can import the MARC records into your library catalog, and then patrons can go straight to the title. And you can request some promotional materials from us, such as rack cards or other Baker and Taylor swag. We are always happy to send that out to you in the library. Next slide, please. And these are other ways to connect with us and learn more about Reading Arizona. You can subscribe to the library services newsletter. It often um, contains information about the newest titles added to Reading Arizona. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and you can reach us um, at that email address. Or you can just go to readingarizona.org. And finally, I just wanted to let you know that the position responsible for managing the Reading Arizona collection has just become vacant. So in addition to the eBooks, this person would also be responsible for the Arizona collection, which is an amazing collection of more than 70,000 titles and tens of thousands of periodicals all about Arizona history, government, and culture. If you know someone who might be interested in joining, uh, working with us here at the State Library, I'll put a link to the vacancy in the chat. And, or you can check out AZ Library's um, job line for the posting. It may not be up there yet. We, it just went live yesterday. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Megan. Uh, this is Mary Villegas. I'm with the Arizona State Library. I work in library development as a library consultant. And I've been working on this project uh, since, it's, since its inception. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about the project, but also uh, give you some background information about Arizona libraries and e-content. Uh, first and foremost, one of um, the things that guides the state library are our five-year plan goals. And one of them is to make sure that residents will have access to information in a variety of formats. And just as some, you know, again, some, some background information, in 2013, 
uh, a product came out called RB Digital. Uh, it was Zinio, uh, an online magazine. And a lot of libraries, a lot of smaller libraries were not participating in uh, providing ebooks to their libraries. So at that time, we decided to purchase uh, RB Digital, uh, the Zinio product for all the rural libraries in Arizona count in Arizona, excluding the libraries in Maricopa County and Pima County, because it would have just been too expensive. And our hope was that the libraries, these smaller rural libraries, would see the value of e-content and start providing um, e-books to their libraries. Because believe it or not, in 2013, a lot, a lot of smaller libraries were not providing these resources. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of that has changed since uh, 2020 with the pandemic. And now that's pretty much uh, what all libraries provide. However, there are a couple that do not provide those resources. A couple of projects we worked on uh, were diversity and inclusive communities. We use, use stimul stimulus money to provide content to libraries that had resources, had were providing eBooks to their patrons. And uh, we set, we actually deposited money into their accounts so that they could order additional resources for their um, communities. We also did, right now we're doing a Digital Discovery 2 project, um, continuation of just Digital Discovery 1. And the difference between the two projects with the Digital Discovery 1 and 2, libraries can purchase any type of content. It could be romance novels, science fiction. With the diversity and the inclusive communities, we had restrictions based upon um, the guidelines that were given to us. And, and as we went through and looked at these communities, uh, we saw that some libraries, very few, were not providing eBooks to their patrons. And so we had been talking about uh, eBooks prior to the pandemic uh, through some leadership summits, but now seemed to be the time to, to get this going. And so we looked at the, at the Simply E app. And one of the things about it was you don't need to necessarily have a website. It's all on your phone or on a tablet. So that seemed to fit the needs for some of these smaller libraries that may not have a website or you know, maybe the capacity or IT help on the back end. So that's kind of how we got to where we are in, in selecting Simply E. So one of, one of the priorities that we looked at were libraries that were not providing eBooks and invited them to be part of the pilot project. But we also wanted to kind of test out the app and find a small rural library that currently had um, eBooks and see how their books could be included in the app. So our original invitees were the Santa Cruz Nogales uh, County Library, the Auction Library, and the Salt River Library. Go ahead to the next slide, please. So unfortunately, again, for these smaller libraries, they ne didn't necessarily have the capacity. So we're still trying to work with them to onboard them. Uh, and what we are doing for the participants, we're using LSTA funds, but we are providing the uh, funds to buy content and also pay for their platform fee. And unlike the uh, Reading Arizona collection, we're just purchasing one copy, one user, uh, that based upon our funding source. And we, the titles range from anywhere from $2.99 to 109, and uh, that's pretty expensive. Next slide, please. And so our collection is about 40% audio and 60% uh, just eBooks. And again, the price is, is pretty, it's interesting because the eBooks, the audio books were more expensive, the most expensive. Uh, the, the Gucci book, that was the one that was $109. And some of the most expensive ebooks were the two that you see. These are kids' books. Um, they were fifty nine ninety nine. Uh, unfortunately, you know those are it's great content for diverse populations, but it's 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 really expensive. 
uh, we were able to purchase 383 titles for the Simply E collection. And we are also able to include the Reading Arizona collection. So everyone has access to the 800 titles that Megan was referring to in addition to the 383. So if you have the app, you have access to that. And we use the same uh, the same vendor as Megan Baker and Taylor's Access 360. We uh, participants can use other vendors like DPLA, but we wanted to you know hit the ground running, and we already were uh, had some accounts with Baker and Taylor, so that seemed to be the easiest option. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, again, just an overview. So the Simply Project. Um, we focused on uh, uh, tribal libraries, mostly tribal libraries, because a lot of them did not have uh, those resources. And right now we still have three, we invited three new libraries to participate and hopefully we can onboard them soon. And again, the, the project includes access to the Reading Arizona titles. Um, and it's available through a Simply E app. And as we go forward, we're hoping to add a lot more titles for this project. So that's all I have, uh, Christine. So I will take over from here um, and talk a little bit about the app itself. It's called Simply E. It's available in your Google Play Store and your Apple App Store. You can download it right now and play with it with the, the collection that's there. The goal of this app is to make it easier for your patrons to use ebooks and audiobooks. That's the point. It is specifically for library patrons, and it was developed originally by the New York Public Library, and libraries and library consortia continue to develop it. And I say that so that you understand that the people creating this app and continuing to develop it actually understand how libraries work. It does include both ebooks and audiobooks. It's for Android and for Apple or iOS devices. And what it does is it gathers titles from multiple ebook and audiobook providers into a single place, into in, in this case, into a single app. These are the providers that are currently part of the app. And I do want to to draw your attention to the green square because that's Baker and Taylor's Access 360 and that's the collection that the tech, the uh, Arizona State Library is using. I will say that if a library wants to use Simply E outside of this project, if they came to Amigos and wanted to use it, if they had any of these other vendors, we could pull those in as well. But the goal of this project is to work with libraries that don't have a, um, additional collections. So what I'm going to do quickly is show you what it looks like on the inside. So we're looking at a tablet view of Simply E, and I've used, of course, Akchin as the example. And you can see each of these lanes is a different type of or different genre. So we have adult fiction and nonfiction, young adult fiction and nonfiction, children and middle grades as well. Up in the upper right corner, you can do a search. So you can either uh, dig down using the subject categories or you can use a search. I also want to show you here that we can provide you a lane which is just the Reading Arizona titles. And Akshin does have this. These titles are also available in the other lanes. So for example, the J.A. Jantz book that you see there, that would also be in the fiction lane. But if you wanted it called out separately, we could provide that. Once you click on a title, there's going to be a button that says get, and that's how somebody downloads it and reads it. There is a little bit of metadata here so they can see a little bit about what the title is about. Um, if they wanted to look at the publishing date, that's there. When you actually start reading it, I have a couple of screenshots of what it looks like. And I want to draw your attention to the upper right corner because patrons can make changes, especially accessibility changes. The very first icon allows you to jump around the table of contents, and that third icon allows you to bookmark pages. But I want to focus in on that second one, which allows a patron to be able to change what the page looks like. So for example, they can change the background and foreground colors. They can also change the font itself. So this is a, a sans serif font. Before we had a serif font, uh, there's an open dyslexic font. And then 
of course, if you look at the bottom, there are some ways that they can find out what they have checked out now, what they have on hold, and of course, if they need to put in their credentials, that's what the settings area is for. So just a really quick overview of that. Why do libraries look at Simply E at all? A couple of things. First of all, because it was developed by libraries, the library becomes front and center and not the vendor. So when you look and through this app, you're not going to see front and center Overdrive's name or even Baker and Taylor's name. Uh, you're going to see the library and that maintains that connection between the patron and the library. It also allows a library to enhance their existing collections if they had more than one ebook collection, they could bring them all together. That way their patrons are, are searching all of their collections, not just the Overdrive collection or the Baker and Taylor collection. It also increases access because it provides you an app. Not They don't just go to your their computer to find something to read or to your library. Now they can also access to your collections through an app. And also highlighting that fourth bullet, again, libraries develop this and continue to develop it. So there's a huge commitment to patron confidentiality. And I do want to say that you get all this because it, Arizona State Library is paying for you. So libraries don't have to pay anything. The libraries that are part of this pilot project don't have to pay anything because the Arizona State Library is paying those charges for you. Um, if you're interested in participating, as Mary said, it, um, it's invitation. So if you're interested in this project, um, number one, tribal library, but contact Mary and she will help you through this. And just so you you know, it there are two forms that need to be filled out. One is just an agreement between Amigos and the library, and the other gives us information about your collections. And then after that, um, any help with your implementation, support, ongoing support, training, all of that is available through Amigos Library Services, which is where I work, at no additional charge to you. So we try to support the project as much as we can. And with that, I'm going to turn you over to Melanie, who has the real world experience. Hello. Skug Tash, Ani Napshigig, Melanie Toledo. Um, good day. My name is Melanie Toledo. <clears throat> I am the library manager for the Auction Indian community. I've been honored to be their library manager for almost 14 years, since 2008. So, so let me give you a little bit of background of um, the Auction Indian Community Library. Um, Auction is located about 35 miles south of Phoenix. Uh, we opened the library in 2009 <clears throat> and Auction has an enrollment of more than 1,100 tribal members and a land base of just over 22,000 acres. Basically, it's the size of Disney World in Florida. We have about 1,500 library uh, card holders, which are um, auction tribal members, residents of auction, and employees who are tribal members and non-tribal members. So basically, a um, little timeline. <clears throat> By 2012, the library had almost uh, 12,000 physical books. Um, back then, I had concerns about uh, running out of space, <laughs> I think as every library does. No one checking out books that, uh, that we purchased that I chose for them. Um, no one returning books <laughs> if they check them out either. So, you know, fines for lost items. Um, we don't do overdue fines here, but we do fines for lost items. Uh, by this time we were operating uh, as a patron, or it's not, not too soon after this, we were operating um, as a patron driven collection. Uh, what does that mean? It means auction library card holders tell me what books uh, they want in the library. So I wasn't going to be ordering like, you know, what was the New York Times bestsellers. Um, basically, the auction community was telling me what they want the titles in, in their library. So books would be requested, again, physical books. Um, I would order the physical book from one of our library vendors, <clears throat> wait, um, book arrives by snail mail. Week or, week or so later, we, we receive the book and we process it, you know, barcode, security strips, labels, then catalog the book in our system. Of course, all that takes time. And um, we didn't get the books pre-processed. 
I felt teaching my entry level employees how to process books was something they could put on the resume. That's how I learned back when I was a student worker <laughs> at UC West Library. Anyway, so I think a lot of tribal libraries process their own books um, because it saves money. Um, and after the books were processed, the, we would call the patron, let them know, hey, your book is ready. So basically it was a two week turnaround time ordering uh, physical books um, by, by request. By, by, by request. So uh, we did a major weeding project before COVID um, shut us down and we weeded about 4,000 books at that time. So in 2014, I applied uh, for the IMLS Native American Basic Grant and was awarded $6,000. <clears> and that's when I decided I wanted to start dabbling uh, with uh, two platforms, Cloud Library and Overdrive, which is now uh, Libby or the Libby app and um, continued Cloud Library and Libby after the grant year was over by adding it to the library budget. So 2016 annual statistics for um, both platforms, we checked out 131 books. And that was pretty good. Cause again, you know, we're doing this all on our own. We're a standalone tribal library. We're not part of a system. <clears throat> then COVID hit four years later. So mid-March, 2020, we closed. And as every library, librarian in the country, um, how do we provide books and library services to our community? Uh, so at that time, um, staff, my staff were learning how to do virtual programming, attending webinars that the Arizona State Library Archives and Public Records um, were offering. Auction library um, card holders started checking out books, ebooks, audiobooks. So we started our virtual programming promoting uh, Libby. By that time, we had phased out cloud, cloud library because people uh, kind of favored the, the Libby app. And uh, when we were shut down pretty much um, January 2020 to the end of December 2020, we were circulating. We had, we had checked out 247 ebooks and audiobooks. We were very excited with that number. So, um, because it kind of almost tripled. Anyway, so all, so right now, all, all Arizona tribal libraries are following strict COVID precautions. Uh, some tribal libraries are even still closed. Uh, some of us are at limited capacity. <clears throat> and here at Noxion, we are only limiting up, up to eight people in the library at one time and um, very limited in-person programs. We're, we don't, we're not like um, the library up the road where uh, we have in-person programs. Um, there's no kind of capacity limit. Uh, so tribal libraries, like some of us are open, some of us are very limited um, operating hours. So 2021, again, um, we were kind of partially open, promoting our eBooks and audiobooks, our Libby app. Uh, 2021, we ended with 477 um, people check or books that were checked out. So that was kind of a really awesome thing. All right. So what do I think of the project, uh, the collection of the Simply E app? Was it difficult or easy to implement the Simply E app? E -app? <laughs> no, it wasn't. Actually, um, we, um, the only thing I had to do was fill out the form and then ask our information systems department to, to fill out the form. And um, we actually met with the uh, Amigos Libraries and Christine and the Arizona State Library Archives and Public Records staff. Um, when I was, I was at home <laughs> in quarantine and we were, I was actually able to do this um, Virtually, virtually from home and just emailing the forms and having our, my technician fill it out and then send it on to the, uh, the RIS department. Um, how does the patron support work? The Amigos team have all been very receptive to our questions. I send an email, they get right back uh, to, to myself or um, Matt, the library technician here. Um, how easy is it to choose Access 360 titles from the collection? I tried to train other library staff, um, and but I ended up ordering all the titles because right uh, at the time I didn't <laughs> I didn't trust my um, my new staff uh, who had you know been here for a year or so because uh, they weren't familiar with with the type of books um, when you go into the um, platform because you're going to see, you know, the inventory, like, you know, what, it, what warehouse, what warehouse do I look at? What inventory do I do? Um, I was afraid they were confused with, um, you know, ordering a paperback book instead of an ebook. 
uh, audiobooks. Um, there's also, you know, um, single 26 circulation, single user two years, single user ARPA prorated. I mean, what, <laughs> what the heck was that? So anyway, so I, I figured that I would take care of the ordering um, initially because um, I was afraid that uh, some of my, my new staff wouldn't be able, they, they wouldn't understand and might order the wrong, the wrong, um, the wrong book or uh, format. Uh, next slide, please. Um, how has it benefited the community? Um, patrons, um, well, some some people still prefer Libby app, but the now, you know, we have the Simply E app, which has um, the books that we have ordered uh, through Overdrive. And <clears throat> so, um, so right now we're we're trying to promote the Simply E app um, to promote the you know the Reading Arizona collection, and also um, if there wasn't a book um, from the OverDrive um, platform, Baker and Taylor might have that book. And um, anyway, so it's so it's it's, it's going to be hopefully more simpler <laughs> to offer one app, and they can go just to the one app and see all the books. And again, like uh, Christine mentioned. You know, it won't be you know from OverDrive, or you have to go to this app to get this other book. It'll just be under one uh, one app. Um, what uh, next question is? What could we uh, be done better um, if we implemented the service again? Or if I uh, have, for instance, I have, I have a brand new staff that just started uh, Tuesday. Um, a quick recorded webinar on how to order eBooks and audiobooks from Baker and Taylor would definitely benefit someone like her to explain um, how and which book. To, to select and how to use the filters because it's a little bit um, kind of confusing if, if you're not familiar with ordering um, from you know from the library book vendors. Uh, what would you say to other libraries that are considering this service? <laughs> Do it um, because um, here in Auction, we actually were phasing out our physical books and transitioning to all digital. The only physical books that we're going to have that we're going to house here and circulate are children picture books. And um, trying to push, uh, if, I'm sure eventually probably going to get rid of our uh, teen titles and our juvenile um, and um, promoting um, access to um, the ebook collection, audiobooks. And one of the things that we've kind of uh, dealt with here too is if um, someone at home calls us and they want a book, um, we can, I, I can order it from. Um, overdrive and or Baker and Taylor now and then um, tell them what to do and they can get the book probably you know, within within an hour and so they don't they don't necessarily have to come in the library anymore to check out a book. Uh, stories. Um, uh, I had more questions for this February program that I promoted. Um, next slide please. So this is just you know blind date with an audiobook and you know, we see other libraries doing it with physical books. I think I've seen some do with ebooks. I'm not sure, but anyway, so this is a kind of our rendition of blind date with an ebook audiobook. I selected some books, um, and then someone calls, texts, or emails us and let us know that they want to participate, and I give them the title. And if they haven't um, read or listened to it, I assign them that title. They had no idea what the book, you know, what the book is about, <laughs> and that's. And then I give them an online Google form uh, to do the book review form, and we do a raffle. Uh, next slide. So what I found out too is a lot of our virtual uh, book programs that we have, our little contests, mainly women <laughs> were the ones that were signing up and interested. So I thought February, again, Arizona's birthday is uh, February 14th. Why not uh, promote the Reading Arizona collection? I did this really quick one day and um, I actually got one guy <laughs> emailing and asked if, if he could be part of this uh, new program. So I was very happy to have a male um, <laughs> interested in, in one of our virtual book programs and um, promoting the Simply E and also the Reading Arizona collection. And that concludes my presentation. Yeah, and, and just to sum up where the State Library is going with this, again, it is a pilot project and we are uh, going to be continuing this for another year, trying to onboard three more or maybe more libraries, we'll see. Uh, but we're gonna have to look at the data, uh, look at the usage and figure out you know, is this a service that is being used by these rural communities? And also the landscape in a year 
or between now and then, things change so much. Company A buys company B, some new technology could come out. So we're going to look at this in a year and see, you know, where we're at. So, but we will continue um, and we look forward to seeing the results. Next slide. Rachel, will you be handling the, the Q&A? Or would you like me to? I absolutely will. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so we are experiencing some te technical difficulties um, where the chat is disabled for the audience, but we have a workaround. Um, if you want to email your questions to development at azla.org, um, we will get those read out and answered. Um, in the meantime, we do have a question that was submitted by, um, let me get back to it, um, by Rita at NAU Library. Um, they say, y'all mentioned that reading AZ patrons at one point were authenticated via geolocation. Now, however, this authentication is no longer used. When users create an account, they specify a state. Can you explain how Baker and Taylor reading AZ authenticates users if not if not via geolocation or by library barcode? Yes, um, when when they go to create the account, the first question that pops up is, um, "What is the name of your state?" And so that's where they type in Arizona. If they typed in something else, they wouldn't let them proceed. But that's essentially. Um, that's essentially what it does to um, to kind of limit the uh, service to Arizonans, which is kind of part of our contract with Baker and Taylor. It is quite possible that other people could enter the name and be able to access it, but it's just that the public just needs to type in Arizona, and then from that point, they create the account. Perfect. Um, I hope that that answers uh, your question, Rita. Uh, we do have another question that has come through. Um, are there libraries that have both Libby and Simply E, or is this intended for library systems that don't have access to Libby? I, I probably can answer that one. Uh, it depends on the library. Uh, most libraries provide uh, all the apps. And so, for example, if you had a Bibliotheca cloud library, you wouldn't get necessarily get rid of the other apps. But what it does is allows your frontline staff to be really, really familiar with one app and be and and be um, a little don't have to know the details of the other apps if you go with simply e because that's where your entire collection is. But um, I wouldn't suggest that it replaces anything and that you would not provide the other apps. I think that that's asking a little bit much. Um, I don't believe that we have any more questions. Oh, wait, um, there is another question. Uh, Melanie, would you be willing to share your blind date materials? Yes, <laughs> I can do that. Um, just send me, um, or if you can send me the email and I can get any, any uh, I can share that, definitely. Perfect, great. Um, I have a question uh, regarding logistics surrounding this. Um, and I guess this is a question for Melanie again. How long does the implementation process take? How long did it take for you? It took, oh, wow. Um, gosh, not, not even that long. I think, prob I would say once we, once I finally fill out, <laughs> finally fill out the form and had my technician look it over, he filled out whatever, sent it to IS, I'm going to say it was probably a week turnaround time. It was, the hard part was just doing, filling out the form. That was really the hardest part. That's fair. That's, that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, while we're waiting for other questions, um, I'm going to ask the panelists, do you have any last thoughts or anything that wasn't included in these slides? Uh, 
Um, I don't have anything to add except that um, we're always happy to hear from library staff. And if you ever need to refer your patrons to us, um, just for any government documents or any of the other services that we offer, just send them over to azlibrary.gov and we'll, we'll help them out. Great. Um, and it looks like we did get another question about accessibility. Um, how accessible are these ebooks in terms of screen reader compatibility? Um, that really depends on where you're getting your ebooks from and what format they're in. Um, I mean, if they're in an EPUB format, they should be pretty accessible to a screen reader. If it is a PDF, um, it de would depend on the publisher it's coming from. And uh, uh, Mary or Megan, can you speak to uh, the collections that are being developed by Baker and Taylor and the Reading Arizona collection? Um, Reading Arizona has ebooks and audiobooks. Um, I would have to check to confirm whether the um, they can be read on a computer, and so I would assume that the the, um, the screen reader works there. If it's done through the app, I am not sure, um, but I I'm, I'm not sure. But on um, on a you know in a browser, I believe the screen reader would be able to read it. Okay. Yeah, and I'm not sure when when I was selecting the books, I was looking at it from a perspective of trying to get as many audio books as possible to because I do know that, you know, in our tribal communities, there are issues with with vision, glaucoma. Um, so that's where I selected the materials. And ideally, each community that participates, they'll know what types of materials will work for their communities. Oh, this is Melanie. I forgot to add, um, Mary just reminded me, I'm sorry. Um, when we were selecting a book, the books, I asked the um, Maricopa Unified School District, the student advisor to ask the teachers what would be in the curriculum for the year. So he went to um, middle school teachers and, and asked all the teachers and they gave back, they gave to him a list of all the books that they would be using in their curriculum. Um, just kind of forward thinking if there was, there was being another school shutdown or something, at least the um, books for the kids um, that they're using their curriculum would be available um, through the platform. Um, so that's what, one thing I did was um, asking the local school schools what they were using in the classroom. Great, that's a really good point. Um, well, um, so it looks like we are at 156, um, and I, we're still waiting on questions, um, but if you have any, if you have any, if you, again, if you have any questions, feel free to email them, um, at development at azla.org, um, and with that being said, I mean, is there anything else, any final, final thoughts from our panelists before we, before we stop? Maybe I'll, I'll speak in, speak up Chris Peterson from Amigos because we deal with a lot of states and we deal with a lot of state libraries. And this is a, this is a very interesting and wonderful project that's coming out of the Arizona State Library. It's specific. Um, to a group that has a need and they have found a way to not just provide a way to get ebooks but has provided the collection and if the tribal library already has ebooks that can be folded into it um, and they allow the libraries to choose the the titles there's there's money that goes to the library to help and they can choose the titles for their um, community so it's it's not a normal i don't see many states doing this type of thing that's that's so targeted um at an audience like this and i and i, I just want everybody in arizona to understand what a great project this really is absolutely well um i want to thank 
uh, our presenters for uh, presenting something that is really very valuable. And yes, it is it is valuable to the residents of the state of Arizona. There's, um, I can say from personal experience, I've worked in public libraries and this, is, this definitely sounds like a game changer. Um, so with that being said, um, if we don't have any more questions, which I'm getting a note that we do not have any more questions, that have been emailed to us. Um, I do wanna thank you all for being with us today. A special thanks to our panelists um, and to the audience. You will receive an email with a link to the recording of this webinar. And with that, I wish you a very wonderful day. Thanks everyone. Thank you, bye. Hey, right, thanks.